So, so why, does, why does autism seem to draw quacks like the Geyers um, to it? And why, why is it possible for them to exploit autism? Well, um, for one thing, it's a complex disease. It has both severe and mild forms. It's probably more than one disease. Uh, it's probably genetic, we now know. And there are probably different genes causing the severe form and the mild forms. Um, the disease has ups and downs. This is a very key, um, key thing about its phenotype. Children get better for periods of time without any treatment. So when you have a disease like that, that means that any treatment you want to apply, if it's not really harming the child, if you just wait long enough, the child will seem to get better. So if you're applying a treatment and the child seems to get better because of the natural course of the disease, then you will, you will give the treatment credit for having made the child get better. And this is what happens time and time again. So if it's a diet, if it's chelation therapy, uh, or if it's something else, um, if your child seems to get better, even if they would have gotten better without the treatment, you don't know that. You know you're doing the treatment, the child gets better, and it seems to work. And quacks can really take advantage of that. Um, also, we don't know the precise cause of autism, and we don't have an effective treatment. So this is unfortunate, and I hope that we will have a treatment someday. But it means that doctors who know what's going on and who are honest with their patients really can't offer them very much. Patients, when they find a doctor who says that he or she can give you a treatment, they latch on to that. That's, you know, they, they are desperate for some kind of treatment. So that makes autism ripe for these quacks to exploit. Let me just say a little bit more about who those people are. Um, here's uh, some comments from, from David Gorski, who writes, who blogs at sciencebasedmedicine.org uh, on Jay Gordon. Um, Jay Gordon has become, Gordon has become the go-to pediatrician that the media seemingly always wants to interview to provide balance to the journal journalist's worship above all else. He wrote the forward to Jenny McCarthy's new anti-vaccine book. Um, and in that forward, he states things, like, uh, states things like vaccines can cause autism um, and that diet and supplements and other alternatives to doing nothing can lead to recovery from autism, period. There's no scientific evidence that this is true, but he says it in the forward to his book as if it's true. So what do you do about that? Um, so here's his website. Yeah. Nothing is proven. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So he says nothing because he knows nothing is proven. So he's sort of pretending to be kind of yeah. objective and thinking about it. But in fact, he's already said, uh, but I know there's a link, but nothing is proven. Yes, he did say that. Here's his website, which I, ha I have to show you just because it's so entertaining. Um, <laughs> so his website is all about advertising all the things he can sell you about his expertise. So he has. Uh, this DVD on vaccinations, assessing the risks and benefits, a must-see DVD feature on Larry King Live. So Larry King is helping him sell DVDs, as Larry King often does. He advertises his own publicity on various TV shows that he's on. He has a book on, this is on, uh, on autism, this is on ADD and ADHD, how he's going to help you cure that as well. Uh, and then he has a second ad for his DVD. If you didn't see that one enough, there's another one down here. Now this is a little bit about the same people. Um, this is from... Uh, the website of Brian Dunning, um, who has a, a podcast that I recommend called Skeptoid, that some of you might have heard. Um, Brian Dunning had a recent podcast, just coincidentally, just a few weeks ago, uh, um, on the 10 celebrities who most promote harmful pseudoscience. So number five on his list was Larry King. Um, <laughs> so that's why I, I had to show you this. Uh, and here's just in bold, when he, has, um, when he has people promoting pseudoscience or paranormal claims, Larry asks no tough questions. He gives them an unchallenged platform to promote their harmful claim. He gives their web addresses and shows their books and DVDs. He acts as their top salesman for the hour and acts like CNN endorses them. Number two on this list was Jenny McCarthy. Jenny McCarthy, the most outback, out, outspoken vaccine, anti-vaccine advocate, is by definition the person responsible for the most disease and suffering in our future generation. Jer Jenny McCarthy's activism has been directly blamed for the current rise in measles. And that's true. And he actually is pretty hard on her, but I think um, justifiably so. David Kirby, so this is David Kirby. There's his book that has made him famous and gotten him a lot of attention, uh, Evidence of Harm, Mercury and Vaccines, and the Autism Epidemic, a Medical Controversy. So just, he's, he is not a medical expert, but he presents himself one at every opportunity. He has learned the lingo, and he can, can spout, he can sort of tell you a lot of things that sound very technical. Um, and this book basically pushes the thimerosal um, autism link. And, and many parents think he's great. Um, and I, I got this from, uh, this is actually not my slide, this is David Kirby's slide. This is the first of about 30 slides of a presentation he just gave a month and a half ago on Capitol Hill on the vaccine autism debate. And, and my reaction to that was, was, why is this guy being allowed to testify before Congress? There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of biomedical experts who could testify about this, who have expertise, 
but instead a journalist, and perhaps because he's very well known, has written a book, he's the one who gets to go and give this lengthy presentation on Capitol Hill, which is really unfortunate because it means that our policymakers are being informed by people who really shouldn't be informing them. So let me, let me look at what science does say. So I'm a scientist and I, I've read some of this literature and I wanted to share with you what, uh, what the scientific research has said. In part because of all this controversy, starting in 1998, there have been many studies now done looking at the question of whether autism and vaccines are linked. Um, so far, over 20 studies have failed to find any link. Let me just show you a few of those. Um, here's one from the Journal of the Medi Amer American Medical Association, JAMA. JAMA, in, JAMA uh, New England Journal of Medicine, and Lancet are generally considered the three top medical journals in the world. Um, so this is looking at uh, a large cohort of, of patients in California, uh, comparing, um, looking at autism and MMR, MMR immunization. Um, and the results were they basically observed no correlation between MMR rates uh, and, and autism. And their conclusions were uh, this, the data do not suggest an association between MMR and immunization among young children and an increase in autism occurrence. So they looked specifically at the rising rate of autism and said it's not being caused by MMR vaccine. Here's another study, a very, very large study done in Denmark. And remember, Denmark removed thimerosal. Um, from the vaccines in the 1990s. But this was actually about the MMR vaccine, uh, and they have very good records, medical records in Denmark, much better than we have. So this study involved over half a million children, so it's a gigantic study. And in this study, and some of them were not vaccinated at all, uh, quite a few of them, um, but of course they didn't design it that way. It was a natural experiment. Um, and they found that the relative risk of autistic disorder in the group of vaccinated children as compared with unvaccinated group was 0.92. And the relative risk of another autistic spectrum disorder was 0.83. So let me say what that means. So relative risk is an important concept in epidemiology. It means how much more likely are you to get something if you have a treatment than if you don't. So if you have a relative risk of, say, two, that means you're twice as likely to get the disease as the other group. If you have a relative risk of less than one, that means you're less likely to get the disease. So the relative risk of the vaccinated children was less than the unvaccinated children. So in other words, if you got the vaccine, you're less likely to be autistic than if you didn't get the vaccine. Less likely over a gigantic cohort, 500,000 over 500,000 children. So not surprisingly, their conclusions said this study provides strong evidence against the hypothesis that MMR vaccine causes autism. That's about as strongly as you can possibly state it in a scientific article. So there are many other studies that I'm not going to go through, but here's a, a partial list of studies. All these studies showed no link between MMR vaccine and autism. So, there are consequences, though, to, to the, the fact that we haven't, despite all these studies, uh, the press continues to promote this link between vaccines and autism. Um, and the consequences of that are that there are a dramatic, there's been a dramatic rise in measles infections in the UK and in the US. Uh, in the UK, it looks like vaccination rates, which went down for a while, are stabilizing and perhaps going back up. In the US, vaccination rates are also dropping uh, because of this. So this is not under control. This rumor is not under control. Uh, there are new outbreaks of other diseases besides measles that, are, that were formerly under control, including whooping cough, which is pertussis. And that's because when parents hear about this, they think it's all vaccines. They don't know that it's just the MMR vaccine, so there's some, some parents are withholding all vaccines from the children. And so other diseases that we did have under control are starting to reemerge. 